Today's Brain Food Show, uh, I'd describe as quite Americentric. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up. I imagine this will be released before Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. A holiday we don't have in, in the UK or Europe, as I'm, uh, as I'm thinking. Is your audio broken again? Because I can hear, see you moving your... <laughs> no, 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 you're no, still okay. there. D- dear listeners, we have had no end... Of te- I can't tell you the amount of technical troubles that I've had this morning, from my Wi-Fi dying to I set up a brand new podcast studio, which completely didn't work when I actually dialed someone in. On- it looked really nice, though. It did look really nice. I set up a new, I set up an entire room in my new studio as a podcast studio, and I was very excited about getting it set up. I got all this new equipment, and I'm like, "Oh, this is going to be great!" And then it completely doesn't work, and so we are about an hour and a half behind schedule this morning. And I don't know about you, man, but I get so frustrated by technical problems because it, and especially when I don't solve them, because then it's just hours in the toilet that could be spent doing something that I actually enjoy and is actually productive, like making a podcast or making some YouTube videos. It just drives me insane. Do you, do you have this or am I just a rageful person? I am quite a rageful person. And it, not really, especially when it comes to technical stuff, because I usually don't have technical problems like this podcast, the exception, like we always have. Yeah. But like in any other thing, I don't, don't really, you know, got to use that degree for something, I guess. But this podcast, it's the, it, you know, Skype and audition. So, so when you when you get a degree in computer science, as you have, does that mean you no longer have like those frustrating Wi-Fi issues that seem to just why is there no connection? Why is there no co- well? There is apps. Nothing has changed. It, you do have them, but then you kind of know how to fix them. I mean, like obviously, like ninety nine percent of the time, how to fix it is just turn off the router and turn it back on. Yeah, it's, turn it back on. <laughs> that does it. There is a reason. That is a trope. Yeah, yeah. That, but you know, otherwise, there's you know, you can usually figure stuff out. Well. I'm distracting myself with this podcast because before you're getting on the call, I was, I was, uh, I might have said a few words that I wouldn't repeat on the air. Let's yeah. say it was a, a bit frustrating. So is Thanksgiving a time when you're grateful for stuff? Is that because I've seen like in American movies where they all hold hands, they thank Jesus, and then they say some <laughs> stuff about how happy they are to be somewhere. And it it's in like every corny American, do you call them like Showtime movies? Or what's uh, that channel that shows like corny family movies? Uh, Hallmark channel, maybe? Hallmark. Yeah. yeah. Like, is it is it like that? Uh, I mean, not like that, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not like a it's whole mostly, movie. I think for most the reality is like, uh, people watch football and eat a lot and like, just kind of hang out, which is sort of just yeah. have a party, which is, I mean, any excuse for that, that's a good, good time. And it kicks off the holiday season. Well, I guess Halloween for some kind of does, but you know, it's the, it's the, you know, go time for Christmas. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, that sounds a lot better. Like okay. I don't even really watch american football or soccer british football regular football yeah. uh either but i'd rather do that than like have some awkward moments of holding my family's hands and telling no. them how grateful i am for something that just sounds like awkward af like, some, some people do that like where they go around yeah no i get it i'm just I, I, i'm know. just not wholesome enough no <laughs> no i that's not yeah i don't i don't enjoy that either so Kick us off. Are we doing quick fact, then a word yeah. from our wonderful sponsors, and then we're cracking on? Well, let's tease the main story. What yeah. are we actually talking so about? So we're actually today? talking about... It's, not, it's sort of... Yeah, it's. I mean, it's kind of Thanksgiving-esque, but really as an excuse to talk about Sarah Hale, Sarah Josepha Hale. Um, that's really just kind of the excuse to talk about her and her significant contributions there, but then also talk about other stuff with her. And then just because it is Thanksgiving, we're going to talk a little bit about the pilgrims and some myths there. And, uh, we're going to kick it off all with a quick fact about why turkeys are called turkeys. I'm about to learn so much about America. Yeah. Like I'm like the pilgrims, the dudes from the boat, right? Yeah. With the, with the brown clothes. And did they come from England on a boat called Mayflower? Is that, am I mixing stories or some such? The Mayflower was an English ship uh, that, yeah, English Puritans known today as the Pilgrims. They did not call themselves the Pilgrims, by the way, which we'll we'll get into in a bit. I'm excited. Yeah. So, well, they are kind of, it's, it's sort of not just American. It's like they, they came from England to go and do Yeah, stuff. well, and Thanksgiving was, uh, it was uh, English, you know, not just English, but the English, you know, commonly did this at the time. Uh, so, you know. Really? Yeah, it was, I mean, not like an annual thing like that. It was really just any time there was an excuse to have a, a day of thanks, you know, give thanks. Mm-hmm. And they did this frequently. And this is kind of how the tradition got brought over here. And then uh, eventually got solidified as a national holiday, thanks to one Sarah Hale, uh, who did a lot of other interesting things as well. I'm excited. Yeah. Hit me with the quick facts. All right. What's going on? So turkeys, you know, I mean, it's weird that they're called turkeys, right? 
you know, so if you've ever thought about this. So it turns out. Really? Like, that's, it's, I feel like that's the same. Well, I see it in the notes. It's like, oh, that's unusual. I'm like, wait, but isn't it weird that we call like a chicken a chicken or a human a human? Yeah. What, what's so weird about turkey? Well, but turkey, you know, because it was actually kind of based off the, you know, the Ottoman Empire. You know, so why why would this North American bird get the name from, you know, turkey? Oh, like yeah. turkey actually like the country turkey. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I thought that was just a weird coincidence. Yeah, because yeah. that, that makes sense. There's not like, you know, just just uh, north of China, the country of chicken. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the um, this actually got about because... It's a great country. There was the, from the Ottoman Empire, there was these turkey merchants that used to import, import a lot of stuff to, to like England and various places. And they, um, among other things, imported a, a guinea fowl, or a, a species cool. of bird called the guinea fowl. And this was also referred to because it was imported by these turkey merchants as turkey fowl. And around at that time, there was also turkey corn and turkey weed. It was just basically anything they imported like that, you know, commonly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when the North American turkey got, you know, discovered and first brought back to Europe, it was first introduced to Spain um, around the early 16th century or so. And then um, kind of throughout Europe after that. And so this, it just kind of got assumed in England and stuff that it was a, you know, a variety of these turkey fowl. Or mm -hmm. these guinea fowl, I should say. Uh, and so just kind of the name, they just called them turkey fowl as well. And then this eventually got shortened to just turkey. And in this case, the name just stuck. And that's why we call turkeys turkey. There you go. Yeah. I, I didn't put the country and the, the bird connection together. I always just assumed it was a coincidence. Yeah. Another coincidence, I actually ate turkey for dinner last night. For really? The, I, I, it's not like something I regularly eat. Yeah. I was just in the butcher and they just had these or more accurately, my wife was in the butcher and they just had these giant like uh, boneless turkey thighs. And she was like, I'll buy those and we'll make them. Yeah. And I'm like, they were surprisingly delicious. Yeah. Yeah. So that was nice. Turkey. Tur Maybe not as good as chicken, but definitely different. Yeah. Turkey breast is pretty good. Um, turkey breast's dry. I like it the, is. I like the legs because you get the, the, the fat in there as well. It is. But the uh, interesting thing about that, the, the turkey breast is they've been breeding them over time to basically have bigger and bigger breasts so that they... They can't even walk properly. These yeah. Days, right? They get so huge, like the Butterball, whatever, you know, company does that. They've, they've gotten it to the point where they're just like so big that they can't actually, those turkeys can't actually mate normally because their, their chest wow. is too big. And so they, um, you know, they artificially inseminate and all that, um, which helps also control breeding and everything easily. Uh, so kind of interesting. Could still be organic. Like yeah. this or I w did we do something about that recently? Or maybe that was on one of the other channels that I do when we was talking about what this organic sticker is just complete nonsense. Yeah, pretty much. It's it, what, you, what you can not what you can get away with and have the organic sticker. And then there's that this I can't remember the name. It's a big American company that's famous for doing like very good stuff, like actually organic. And they're like, no, we don't use that label because it means nothing. We we boycott it. Oh, nice. Anyway, that's turkeys. Uh, so I would like to now mention our great sponsor, Lou Merit. We've talked about them before. Uh, they're the guys who basically work out the most efficient way for you to go to college or university, as I would call it, and either start and finish or just finish a degree that you actually never finished. I know a lot of people who dropped out of university and then you think, oh, it'd be good to go back and finish that. And with Lou Merit, they, they make that very easy to do. I was thinking like, you, we we already talked about your degree and its usefulness in fixing Wi-Fi. Yeah. I didn't get a degree in anything that has this kind of actual life practice. Oh, well, maybe like it's sort of useful, but yours is business, right? I still think uh, business and then law. Yeah, and then I think you'd think that would be really like, practical. Both of those things. Okay, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk smack about university in an ad spot where we're talking about how useful university is supposed to be, and it really is useful. Um. But I went to like business school for my bachelor's for the undergrad. And it's kind of it teaches you a lot about running like a real or like being a manager in a really big company. Like, so you do like think, how do you deal with Japanese businessmen? It's like, I have yet to have to deal with Japanese businessmen in my like career as a YouTuber. And you'd think it would kind of be useful like to do like a balance sheet or like a, a profit and loss or accountancy. But it's like, well, no, like I pay someone a few hundred equivalent of like a few hundred dollars a year to do that for me because I don't want to do that. And it's not what I do and all yeah. of this stuff. And it's the practical stuff. I think like the for what we do, like the analytical skills that you get, the study skills, the working skills. Also, for me, I don't know, like I wasn't ready to enter the world at 18. I was kind of like a big child. <laughs> I needed like a few more years to kind of 
get my shit together and become like an adult who was capable of functioning in the world. And I felt like university was quite a good bridge to yeah. that point yeah, that, of being like, instead of being 18, being like 22. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, so university is useful if you want to fix the Wi-Fi or also uh, second one was pretty useful. Like it's nice to, although it's very specific to the UK, but knowing stuff about the law, it's quite useful in general. Like if you have something and some companies like, hey, we're not going to refund you the money for this. You can be like, well, actually, according to the Sales of Goods Act 1979, you actually do need to give me a refund. And they're like, damn it. Well, and I can tell you, uh, lawyers make the absolute best researchers to hire. They, they, Is that right? they get every little tiny detail right, or at least as correct as it can be. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine you getting on with them, like going into absolute depth of like yeah. one thing and looking for every little detail. Yeah, like, they do. They do. Yeah. It's great. I've, I've, I've found them to be superior to all other professions um, at research. There you go. Yeah. One day I'll have to write for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, we should get back to this ad spot. Oh, yeah. uh, Lumerit, basically, what they do is they help you go to college without so much debt. So you don't. Oh, by the I hate to do another aside because this gets really long and I, I hope people appreciate the asides that we put into these, but basically Lumerit make it more affordable. We actually did a, uh, a video spot for them and it was about World of Warcraft and the plague that almost destroyed it. And I was like, this is so perfect because there's the joke in the ad spot about living in your parents' basement <laughs> because you got broke from spending all that money at university. And I was like, this is amazing that it's sponsoring this World of Warcraft <laughs> yeah. uh, ad spot. Another way to spend time in your parents' basement. Anyway, student debt sucks. You can you can avoid a lot of it with Lumerit, and you don't want to be that person who's graduated and then owes a ton of money to various different companies, because then you kind of go and have to choose that job that pays a lot of money rather than the job you actually want to do. So what Lumerit does is basically if you go to lumerit.com, which is L-U-M-E-R-I-T.com forward slash brain food, you can go there. They'll run a few calculations for you, working out the best way for you to get the credits you need to graduate without paying a fortune and without wasting a ton of time on extra classes that you don't need. You can do classes online and in person, and then you graduate from a school that you actually choose. Like I was looking at the list and I was like, I know that university. I know that university. So it's not like university of online dodginess degree which no one cares about it's like really a, a legitimate thing which is which is fantastic so don't get screwed on those student loans just go to lou merit l-u-m-e-r-i-t dot com forward slash brain food and check it out uh, you got nothing to lose so uh tell me a bit about this uh is it josepha or jose what did you say i was I always with, reading in my head as josepha i went with josepha but i can see josepha. how it could very well be josepha the good news is it's her middle name, so we could just call her Sarah Hale. Yeah, it is better. Um, okay, go on then. Tell me a little bit about her. I think Mary had a little lamb, I yes, think, she, remembering she from was, a video uh, a while back. That is what people would probably best know her for, is Mary had a little lamb. Uh, she wrote that, I think it was 1830 or so, was uh, one of, in one of her, I think it was her second book of poems. But beyond that, uh, she did a number of other interesting things in her lifetime, and we're going to start with the Thanksgiving one, and we'll get on to some non-American Thanksgiving-related stuff in a bit. It's very thoughtful of you. Yeah, yeah. Although I'm excited to learn about all of this. Yeah. So, all right. So in the 19th century, Thanksgiving was sort of this thing that was uh, celebrated kind of in New England as an annual event. In, like, different states there would do different times, though it wasn't like a set thing that everyone did. Um, and then through the rest of the country, like there were like Thanksgiving type things. But for the most part, it wasn't like what we think today or anything like that. Uh, so it wasn't really a popular thing. And this this Sarah Hale, she she decided that it should be a thing. Um, she's obviously from New England. So she wanted it to to be sort of a thing that the nation did. She thought it'd be sort of a unifying thing again in the U.S. at the time. Uh, the you know, the states were more like your state first, country second type of thing. Obviously, that changed, particularly uh, around the Civil War, after the Civil War. Um, but this was kind of a thing. And so she thought it would be kind of a unifying thing for the whole nation. And so as mm -hmm. such, she used her, her um, very prominent position, which we'll get into uh, shortly, uh, to write editorials. She wrote governors, congressmen, senators, and uh, petitioned five presidents. Um, to basically establish a national Thanksgiving holiday that would be kind of modeled after some of these traditions that were in the, the New England holidays, the various ones. And so she just did this and she thought, uh, so her first sort of editorial on the subject was written in 1837 and she stated uh, kind of her why she thought um, this would be a good idea, uh, noting the event. Yeah, she writes, uh, 
might without inconvenience be observed on the same day of november say the last thursday in the month throughout all new england and also in our sister states who have engrafted it upon their social system it would then have a national character which would eventually induce all the states to join in the commemoration of ing gathering which it celebrates it is a festival which will never become obsolete for it cherishes the best affections of the heart the social and domestic ties it calls together the dispersed members of the family circle and brings plenty joy and gladness to the dwellings of the poor and lowly and as for why she picked the last thursday of november she states the last thursday in november has these advantages harvests of all kinds are gathered in summer travelers have returned to their homes the diseases that during the summer and early autumn often afflict some portions of our country have ceased and all are prepared to enjoy a day of thanksgiving yeah so so at the time missing a significant number of commas in that in that quote yeah, right this now. was definitely definitely from the era when like punctuation was just kind of whatever you wanted and you had page long you know sentences basically so just just because people can't see this at home just there's basically no commas in that entire quote except around have ceased where you really shouldn't have any commas at least by modern standards because that makes it kind of like an aside of our country have ceased and all are prepared to which makes no sense it's just hey i use commas here because they look good and she was one of the most prominent authors of her day wow and you know wrote for a living wrote prolifically uh, as you'll see soon enough um so yeah she had so again, again at the time in uh, new england and stuff they you know you might celebrate it in september you might do it in august you might whatever everyone had their their own different things so she just wanted to solidify it as all the same time and then hopefully from there her strategy was then it would just sort of catch on if like a number of states would do it uh, then other states would pick it up and so uh, towards this end she started you know petitioning the various governors to all unify on this date and then and then try to convince others to just you know declare a thanksgiving holiday in the first place um, and she had some success over the years, uh, a couple decade campaign. Uh, she started to get quite a lot of governors on her side. But the president, she thought she wanted to get the president because then the president had was kind of in a position to maybe get everyone to do it. Uh -huh. And so she went through five presidents before she finally found one in Lincoln who actually listened. And so on September 28th, 1863, she sent a letter to Lincoln, which stated in part. Uh, she wrote. You may have observed that for some years past, there has been an increasing interest felt in our lands to have the Thanksgiving held on the same day in all the states. It now needs national recognition and authoritative fixation only to become permanently an American custom and institution. For the last 15 years, I have set forth this idea in the ladies' book and placed the papers before the governors of all the states and territories. Also, I have sent these to our ministers abroad and our missionaries to the heathen and commanders in the navy. From the recipients, I have received uniformly the most kind approval. But I find there are obstacles not possible to be overcome without legislative aid, and it has occurred to me that a proclamation from the President of the United States would be best, surest, and most fitting method of national appointment. Now, the purpose of this letter is to entreat President Lincoln to put forth his proclamation appointing the last Thursday in November, which falls this year on the 26th, as the national thanksgiving for all those classes of people who are under the national government particularly, and commending this union thanksgiving to each state executive, thus, by the noble example and action of the President of the United States, the permanency and unity of our great American festival of thanksgiving would be forever secured. An immediate proclamation would be necessary so as to reach all the states in season for state appointments, also to anticipate the early appointments by governors. Excuse the liberty I have taken. With profound respect, yours truly, Sarah Josepha Hale, editress of the ladies' book. Yeah, she, Ooh, I like editress. She did. She, like, she pushed hard for that editress uh, thing. She didn't like to be called an editor, which, uh, which you know, that's not really editress. I don't think is a thing any uh, at all, is it? My my Google Doc is telling me that it is spelled incorrectly. Okay. So yeah. It's it suggests the the correction of address. Yeah. Yeah. She she wanted that, and she was one of the first ever uh, female editors. So she kind of was, you know, trying to set the set the tone for what they should be called, but you know, failed on that one. You just However, go, editor. I I just I just looked it up in the dictionary. Yeah. Because we live in the future, you can do that with two clicks, and it is a noun. Noun. Editress. Plural. Editresses. One. Hmm. A female editor. So it is in the dictionary. It is there. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, so anyways, uh, so she sent that again. I, what, what did I say? Uh, September 28th. And then on mm -hmm. October 3rd, Lincoln made the following announcement, which stated. October the 3rd of the same year? Lincoln is 
Yeah. On the move. Yeah, well, she did uh, encourage him at the end of there to an immediate proclamation was necessary, if he, you know. Yeah, but people send me emails all the time saying, I'd immediately like to know about this about on your channel. And I'm like, yeah, but you're, uh, I'm just, no. Yeah, well, but, I mean, but to be fair, at the, the State of the Union at the time, it kind of needed something unifying like that. So he was probably that's, that's true. all on board. That's true. All, all on board with this. So, uh, yeah, October 3rd, he states. I mean, it's a good idea. I still would expect like some more delay than a few days yeah. from the president. Well, just the fact that she um, sends a letter to the president, he gets it and reads it. And then, you know, like that was a thing. Fairly remarkable. That was a thing back then. And she did have connections, you know, to make sure he got to see the letter that the, the common folk necessarily didn't have. But, you know. Okay. Either way, I'm impressed by Lincoln on this one. Okay. So what was that? A few days later, Lincoln announces... This, uh, the year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever-watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seen to foreign states to invite and to provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations, order has been maintained, the laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theatre of military conflict, while that theatre has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and the navies of the Union. Needful diversions of wealth and of strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The axe has enlarged the borders of our settlements, and the mines, as well of iron and of coal and of precious metals, have yielded even more abundantly than heretofore. Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp, the siege, and the battlefield, and the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also, with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience, commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the interpretation of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. In testimony whereof I have hereunto set my hand, and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington, this third day of October, in the year of our Lord 1863, and of the independence of the United States, the 88th. Woo! That is a record. That is a record quote. That was long. It's a good thing you don't have a sore throat or anything. <laughs> I do have a slight sore throat today, yeah. or like, just uh, not I'm not not sick, just like yeah, uh, this Flemmy, Flemmy. There we go. It was Share, good. I, I liked the I liked your Lincoln voice. It's very British Lincoln <laughs> yeah. voice, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read for five minutes in an American accent because I will be just ripped apart yeah. in the reviews of this podcast. Hey, leave us a review on iTunes or wherever if you want to. Yeah. yeah so this go. this was just going. You know, this announcement was just for that particular. November Day, and but it's, yep, it yep. ended up being the case that uh, uh, every year after that, uh, every president would declare the last, uh, up to a point, uh, which we'll get to in a second, would declare the last Thursday in November as the as you know Thanksgiving. Which uh, there was a couple exceptions. One was Andrew Johnson uh, after Lincoln would declare the first Thursday in December for some reason uh, instead, and then uh, finally also. Oh, I should say also Franklin D. Roosevelt. He caused a bit of a stir, which caused Congress to finally step in and set an official date rather than have the president 
um, announce it because Franklin D. Roosevelt, he decided that it shouldn't be the last Thursday in November. It should rather be the second to last Thursday to extend the holiday shopping season. And so he did this. He declared this in 1939, 1940, 1941. And at this point, of course, it had been long established that it should be the last Thursday in November. So this how does that extend the holiday shopping season? Though? By one week. So everyone kind of starts shopping, obviously, right after Thanksgiving. That's kind of a... So uh, it was basically to boost... Uh, everyone is way more organized than me. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. like, oh, it's Christmas next week. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so the... yeah. Well, actually, that's a thing I was going to mention later, but I'll just mention it now. It turns out to Black Friday is not the most popular shopping day of the year, as is commonly stated. It turns out, which Black Friday, I don't know, you know, that's like right after Thanksgiving, right? Like the day after, right? Oh, yeah, we have Black Friday. Oh, okay. I mean, commerce crosses all borders. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the this uh, this is not the most popular. It turns out it turns out the most popular uh, shopping day of the year is almost always the Saturday before Christmas, except for when Christmas falls on the weekend day, which uh, then the biggest shopping day usually is the Thursday or Friday. Uh, before Christmas. So the procrastinators most definitely uh, outnumber the early birds. Yeah, it, it, it makes sense. I mean, as much as you could get like a good deal on Black Friday, it's it's just easier to be like, I'm just going to do this later. Yeah, so... Ah, uh, humans. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, because of the deals, of course, Black Friday is is usually pretty popular. It's usually, it's, it's usually not even in the top five, but it is usually falls in the top 10 of shopping days of the year. So um, every now and then it does crack the top five. Though. Wow. I'm really surprised. I, I thought it would be up there. Yeah. I mean, I get the... I, I So you got... I, I guess you've got a couple of days. You've got all those days before Christmas must be pretty strong. And I think nowadays, especially if you look at the numbers nowadays, it's really shifted in the last, you know, five or six years with the online mm. shopping and then people, you know, the online retailers kind of extending usually that sort of sales to earlier in the week and then just everyone shops Dude, online. I'm already so, getting things about Black Friday. Yeah. We're recording this on the 16th. Yeah, so they kind of extend it out, so it's not really like a one-day thing where like everyone goes to the stores as much as it used to be, mm. um, which is nice for traffic. Dude, those, I, those videos where people like yeah. storm into places and they're like beating each other up. Or you, then... every, now, every now and then you'll get the Walmart, uh, someone gets trampled to death type thing. That, yeah. That's a thing that happens sometimes. Yeah, um, but uh, it's uh, the pretty intense stuff. Yeah, but anyways, this was this was Roosevelt's idea. If he made it uh, the second to last Thursday in November, then you would have you know a slightly longer shopping season. Hopefully, boost the economy. That was what he was going for. Unfortunately, FDR did know some stuff about the economy. Yeah, day. That was his, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, though, only about half the states went along with this because it had been so long that everyone had done the last. So just half were like, no, we're gonna still do it the last Thursday in November, except Texas. Texas, I love this. Texas, they decided that they would just take both days as holidays. So they'd get two Thanksgivings. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, instead. <laughs> so this finally, this is kind of a mess. And Congress finally stepped in in October of 1941 and to go in effect the following year in 1942. And they did a compromise, basically making it the, um, the fourth Thursday of November. So this is sometimes the last yeah. and sometimes the second last uh, Thursday okay. of November. They kind of get okay. both. Texas took two holidays. I know, that's, that's amazing. That's great. Is that stereotypically Texas? I don't know. Or like, I don't Texas. know. To, to me, Texas is like cowboys. Yeah, these, it's cowboys in Texas? Uh, I mean, yeah. It, it kind of, Texas definitely has the reputation of we're Texas, we do what we want, you know, kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> Texas. Yeah. Because it's like, I can imagine like it, in, in Europe, we'd say like the French would stereotypically take like if there was oh, yeah. the option to take two holidays, the French would be like, how about we just take both holidays and all the days in between? <laughs> <laughs> but I was just wondering if Texas had the same reputation. Oh no, I don't think I, I don't think quite that reputation, but definitely the reputation okay. of we do what we want. Um, so yeah, so Hale, her <laughs> contribution to Thanksgiving did not just stop there. She also popularized um, many of the things we think about the pilgrims, uh, the common kind of stuff that's largely myth, uh, and yeah. then uh, a lot of the you know the stuff like we eat. Like uh, she was the one who really pushed turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, cranberry sauce, and pumpkin pie. Um, she didn't come up with this. It was you know stuff that people ate in New England at the time. Uh, so she just sort of popularized it to, as to be like the idyllic uh, Thanksgiving meal or whatever. And this is just kind of how we do it today. Are, are you aware that this is what we eat at Christmas? Yes, it is. It is sort of a Christmas thing as well here. But uh, uh, OK. Yeah, but it's also because okay. don't you have ham at Christmas? I thought it's like a Christmas that is, ham. Some people do ham, but ham is uh, also more on Easter, I think, which is. Um, yeah, we would do Easter or lamb at Easter as well. Yeah, and that, that actually the, the ham and lamb on Easter is actually largely because that's the meat that was available. Like that's how that tradition kind of came about. Mm. Uh, because, you know, before mass refrigeration and supermarkets to ship everything where everyone can have everything any time of year. Uh, this this was like a thing where it was just like what meat's available. And this is largely turkey. 
Turkey is really good. Yeah. Turkey was really prevalent in the fall. So yeah, that's a great one. And then, but you know, by the end of, um, the end of winter, pretty much all you'd have left would be ham. Cause it, you know, the, the way they cure it and everything, it kind of lasts a lot longer than the uh-huh. other meats. And so this was kind of like ham. And then of course, lamb, like you say, is also available. I do know about those lambs because like you'll be, you know, driving through the countryside and, oh, look at all those lambs. Yeah. They're so cute. And we're going to eat them all in about two weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so this, this was kind of how that got established. And so <laughs> I'm so hungry now. Yeah, I'm like, mm, seriously, cute lambs. seriously, anytime researching or writing anything to do with food, it's just like at the end, you're like oh, so man. hungry. I don't think I've ever had pumpkin pie, but even that, I'm like, mm, could go for some mm, pumpkin, pumpkin pie. Pumpkin pie is like a texture thing. I, I, the taste is fine, but it's just like slime a little bit. You know, know, like it's got a weird texture, but you just smother it in like ice cream and like really thick crust. Oh, yeah. And then it's, then it's quite good. Oh, you know what I forgot to get for today's episode? I know follow-ups later. Oh, but bam. I didn't get, did you get spam? I did get some, but I forgot to bring it. It's upstairs in my kitchen. Uh, I went to the, I went to the big giant supermarket and they normally have it. They didn't have it. And then the, the British store was closed, but I'll go to the British store. They'll, they'll have it. Or if not, I can ask them to get it. I'm sure they can, yeah. they can probably get that. Oh yeah. And, uh, I should say SC Silk from the forums actually says if we buy spam before we eat it, yeah. we must fry it. Apparently it's delicious fry. Yeah. 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 This is how my grandma used to okay. make it. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to like fry it up in a take pan. it from the can and see how it was. <laughs> Well, we can do both. Yeah, I think I think I, I do remember it being fairly rough from the from the can. It's like kind of fatty and weird, like uh, army rations or something. Yeah, yeah, like the yeah. cat food or something, like the wet cat food. Oh god, yeah, that stuff's horrible. You've got cats, right? I, I used do. to have a cat. I do. Yeah. That stuff stinks. That's, this to me is just re- this is what spam reminds me of so much, uh, visually anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> got to get over that one. That's not a good time. Oh, we could also taste cat food. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> All right, so going back to that, she she uh, helped popularize, of course, as, as I said, the turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, all that. Um, so this, mm-hmm. the, despite the fact that there is no real evidence that uh, either way that uh, that's what the pilgrims ate in the sort of supposedly momentous Thanksgiving. Um, and so this this brings us around to some common myths, common myths about the pilgrims and the supposed first Thanksgiving. First off, mm-hmm. it was not the first Thanksgiving in America, as is commonly stated. In fact, the pilgrims Thanksgiving event, the the 1621 one that's so popular uh, was not even there first Thanksgiving. Uh, they had several before this. Uh, it was just sort of a thing again, whenever you wanted to give thanks. And this was going back you know, to England and various parts of Europe. This was just a thing people did all the time. Uh, it wasn't really a, uh, you know, noteworthy or anything. It was just like, Hey, we have a reason to give thanks about something. Uh, and uh-huh. they didn't really need huge excuses to do this. And sometimes they were just like events where you just literally, like it wasn't like a feasting thing. It was literally just a day of thanks. You didn't, you know, maybe even day of a fasting in some cases. But And then other times it was just like an excuse to throw a party and be thankful. Uh, um, a little <laughs> bit more like today. And so this, so who actually celebrated the first Thanksgiving in America? Uh, nobody knows. But the first I could find was in September 8th, 1565. So this was, you know, a long time, like almost 70 years before the Pilgrims' momentous one. And this was uh, Spaniards, actually, led by Spanish explorer Pedro Menendez de Avila uh, in St. Augustine, Florida. And he actually, interesting about this one, he did indeed actually invite the Temucao tribe to dine with them on that Thanksgiving, which was quite interesting because the Pilgrims are supposedly invited the Native Americans. This is the common sort of uh, thing. You see it in all the things. But it turns out... There's no actual evidence that they invited uh, the tribe around them to come to their Thanksgiving party at all. My limited knowledge of American history is the settlers didn't really get on. No, the they, the, especially at this point, like there was often the natives would come and just wipe them out. This was a thing that happened sometimes. Yeah. That, that's what I meant by not get along. Yeah, I mean, in some cases they <laughs> did. Like, they, they fought brutally. In some cases, like in this case, they seem the pilgrims kind of had a friendly relations, uh, it would seem. Although they just, it just, there's no record of them actually inviting uh, the mm-hmm. the Native Americans around uh, from the so we kind of the main things we have to describe uh, this sort of 16 December of 1621 Thanksgiving thing was from a letter from Edward Winslow and then uh, on William Bradford's uh, his passages of on of Plymouth Plantation and this and there was no record of any invite there uh, it does seem that the Native Americans did stop by uh, at random times but sp- presumably just attracted by the noisy games they had like shooting contests and stuff like turkey shoot type thing was like a thing mm-hmm. um i don't know if it was actually turkey but they they would you know shoot stuff just target practice and just lots of fun games and they did stop by uh, but it just you know doesn't seem like anyone invited them 
really. It was just kind of stopped by and, uh, you know, for a bit. Um, it's like, that sounds like a cool party. Let's crash. It. Yeah. And so this this was just sort of one of many myths. We'll get into more myths later regarding the pilgrims. But yeah. for now, going back to Hale. So she kind of just got this holiday formalized. This was going on for a long, yeah. like something around this was happening. It was definitely like, like in her in her youth, it was more of like just a New England thing. I mean, they, people had Thanksgiving things, but oh, like, that's right. but as, as to be as like an annual event and in the way we kind of think about with like this big feast and all this, uh, this was kind of just like a New England thing mostly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, and then she definitely wanted this to get spread throughout the country and then kind of got it formalized through her quite tireless and incessant campaigns on the on the matter and uh and yeah and she kind of modeled it after sort of the new england traditions regarding it um and so yeah gotcha you were going to tell me more about yeah that? sorry now we're going to move on from the thanksgiving stuff to just some other stuff she did because she was a pretty remarkable woman especially so in the late 18th century when she was born she was born in 1788 this was like even just educating a woman was not really a thing. Like Ben Franklin, if you read his autobiography, actually talks about this, where he was advocating for women to be educated. And and he kind of sort of just jokingly says, like, it's a lot more entertaining because women are fun to hang out with and talk. But the, to, to him, the uneducated ones were not fun to hang out with and talk to. But, the you know, the few educated ones were like, you know, a lot of fun. And so this was kind of his he, uh, talked about. And so this at this point just was. Well, is that is that like a controversial thing to say? Like. I don't know. Um, I mean, it's kind of, it's crass, If you're interested maybe. in talking about educated things, regardless of gender, yeah. I don't think education is something, is it, is, it, is it politically incorrect to say that you'd rather hang out with educated people I think people just like pointing, uneducated pointing people? that out as like the reason women should be educated instead of, you know, like, <laughs> that, you know, just, I don't know. It just seems like a weird well, reason. Well, I think that's state. the reason men should be educated. Yeah. I think it's the reason all people should be educated because it makes them more interesting. It gives them... Uh, yeah. Better analytical minds well, and, yeah. and, and better ability to discuss and things. Speaking of education, Lumerate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They have many benefits. It's just kind of a funny reason to state it, like it, when not stating the rest of it, like you say. Uh, but yeah. I, I, I don't know. I find it ref- like yeah. uh, refreshingly frank in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ben Franklin was yeah. refreshingly frank about every little thing. If you go read his autobiography, <laughs> it's great. Everyone should read it. So, anyways. This, I mean, she was born from humble beginnings. I'm not like super humble. Her, you know, her father was like a cap- sea captain or something like that. So, I, oh, that's a cool time. Yeah. So he, I mean, she was kind of, I suppose, like a middle class, I suppose. Uh, but, but it was, you know, women weren't really educated and she didn't have an opportunity. Like there was no school around that would take her to teach her. So her mother, mm-hmm. she got first. First with her mother and then her brother, Horatio, which I, I love the Horatio, Horatio angle of this, but... Horatio. Yeah. We'll, we'll, start, with, uh, we'll start with her mother uh, educating her, sort of homeschooling her, she noted of this. I owe my early predilection for literary pursuits to the teaching and example of my mother. She had enjoyed uncommon advantages of education for a female of her times, possessed a mind as clear as rock water, and a most happy talent of communicating knowledge. Yeah, and so this was kind of her early education, and then we come to her brother Horatio, who handled her advanced education, and this is, he's like the brother of the year award right here. Um, So she, uh, to begin with, she stated of uh, him. Uh, He seemed very unwilling that I should be deprived of all his collegiate advantages. So while he was attending Dartmouth, uh, he would come home after his classes, and then he would basically just teach her what he learned that day in his classes. He would kind of just recite from his notes what, what they went over. Mm-hmm. And then they would spend the evening studying together. Uh, and then so he eventually ends up graduating from Dartmouth and getting a diploma. But of course, she can't get a diploma because there was no at the time there was no university in the, the country that would award a woman a diploma, even if she had attended. And so instead, he gave her uh, a diploma from the Horatio Gates <laughs> Buell College, which uh she stated on it that she graduated summa cum laude, which is the, that's just with highest distinction, with a degree in the arts. Um, and so this this is how she got her sort of informal degree and her higher education. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, yeah. That's like just a brother of the year. Yeah, that's just a great brother right there. And so this at the age of 18. Also epic name, Horatio, yeah. with his father, a sea captain. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so at the age of 18, she's now graduated from the Horatio Gates Buell College. Um, and yeah. she becomes uh, a school teacher, which was one of the only school female school teachers uh, in the country at the time. Um, and so, yeah, just 18 years old. And she did this for, I think it was six or seven years until she met one David Hale. Uh, so I, at the time, she was Sarah Josepha Buell. Um, but yeah, so uh, soon to be Sarah uh, Hale. And so she meets him. He's a lawyer. Uh, and she's 25 years old. They get married. 
And then he he was extremely supportive of her educational endeavors. He was definitely in the Ben Franklin mind that uh, a wife who was super educated was way better than one who didn't know anything <laughs> or wasn't educated at all. And so this this uh, she noted of sort of their kind of habit of learning together. They were both just insatiable learners. And she noted of this. We commenced soon after our marriage, a system of study and reading, which we pursued while he lived. The hours allowed were from eight o'clock in the evening till ten, two hours in the twenty-four. How I enjoyed those hours in all our mental pursuits. It seemed the aim of my husband to enlighten my reason, strengthen my judgment, and give me confidence in my own powers of mind, which he estimated much higher than I. But this approbation, which he bestowed on my talents, has been of great encouragement to me in attempting the duties that have since become my portion. Approbation? That's a new word to me. Do you know that one? I can't look it up. It's, uh, I, I'm not connected to the internet, apparently. Approbation, approval or praise. Ah, okay, there you go. Yeah. So approval so or praise. Gave her, it boosted talents. her self-esteem and which came in handy later with, with, with her later career. Uh, so he also can, he, uh, very much encouraged her to write short stories, poems, and articles and try to get them published, which some of them actually were in newspapers and journals. And this was quite important because unfortunately for her, nine years after they got married in 18, uh, in 1822, she, um, while well, she was actually pregnant with their fifth child, uh, he, David Hale died of pneumonia. So this leaves her pregnant. Uh, a couple weeks later she had the baby and then she's, so now oh. she has a newborn baby and four kids, the oldest of which was seven, only seven at the time, and a woman in the early uh, 19th century with, I mean, she wasn't, like again, like sort of a middle-class-ish, you know, so didn't really have a lot of money uh, to her name yeah. to, to sort of work things out. So she had to raise these kids, support them somehow with money at a time when, you know, you couldn't really get a job or there wasn't many jobs yeah. available as a woman. And, uh, yeah, so this, this, wasn't, this wasn't ideal. Um, Dude, past was really intense. Yeah, not not a good time for her. Yeah. And actually, she wore. I mean, they were obviously for, you can tell from her quote quite clo close. And she wore black actually publicly from the day he died to the day she died, which was fifty seven years later. She would only wear black. Wow. Uh, in public, and this is uh, not notable because she sort of became the fashion queen of her day. Uh, mm -hmm. And but she herself only wore black. Um, so yeah, just sort of. Wait, how did she become a fashion queen while she was black? Yeah, uh, just while for she was you'll, just black. You'll see. Yeah, you'll see. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, teaser. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just in perpetual mourning for her husband. So how did she do this? Right. How did she uh, manage to to support and uh, not only support her family but become one of the most successful and influential women of her era uh, after this? So she she begins she begins very humbly starting a millinery business, which is just making hats for women. Uh, to support herself and the kids, and this didn't really work out very well. Uh, didn't provide sufficient funds, and I don't know. She she then decided that she would move on uh, to something else, um, stating, "Very few employments in which females can engage with any hope of profit, and my own constitution and pursuits made literature appear my best resource." Yeah, so she did have. She had written many poems uh, over her time, you know, previous mm -hmm. years. So she decided to compile these all into one book and then, of course, getting published, especially like, uh, I mean, a female author, they did, there weren't a lot of companies wanting to publish them. And so this, mm -hmm. this was, would have been otherwise difficult, if not impossible, had it not been that her husband had been a Freemason and the local lodge decided to uh, give her money basically to get the book published, uh, to publish it and then sell it. And this was moderately successful and it allowed that combined with her um, just sort of continuing to try to get stories and poems and stuff published in newspapers and journals, provided her enough money to basically support herself, uh, which is quite a, you know, interesting thing for, for that, for her era to be able to do that. Um, yeah. And this all led to then the sort of the thing that really launched her career uh, was the next thing she worked on, which was a book called Northwood, Life North and South and in England. And so this is how popular it was. It actually jumped to the pond and was quite popular in England mm -hmm. as well. It was called A New England Tale. Uh, and this this was actually one of the first ever books that dealt with slavery as a central part of the plot. And just um, I mean, to her, she she definitely was of the camp that uh, uh, slavery was to quote her a stain on our national character. Um, I would I would be surprised, like given her, yeah. given how we've talked about her so far. She was like, no, it was incredibly pro slavery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was really like everything about it was wonderful, except she really loved slavery. Yeah. Yeah, and this also interesting, just uh, tying back to the Thanksgiving thing, this was also one of the first ever books to go into great detail. And I, w I did 
originally put the quote on here, but then I figured you'd been reading. You've already read so many quotes. I wasn't going to make you read this one, uh, but it was just yeah, sort of quotes <laughs> with complete lack of grammar. Yeah, this in like it's like a page long describing this uh, the kind of a traditional New England holiday Thanksgiving. Um, and it was uh-huh. kind of one of the first books to really describe that and just sort of, you know, to, to sum up, basically just described, uh, you know, huge, like many tables just laden with lots of different types of foods and drinks and families getting together and partying, basically. Um, but just as well as making me read it and it being very long, it would also make me very hungry. Yeah, so. yeah, no, it, it, totally. Um, but yeah, if you can just picture like these sort of, uh, you know, lots of food, lots of drinks, lots of, you know, mm-hmm. hanging out and having fun. That's kind of what it was about. And so, yeah, this this book was extremely popular and uh, made her a good amount of money, but also, more importantly to her future career, got to, it was read by one Reverend John Blake. He was the headmaster of Corn Hills School for Young Ladies, and he was interested in starting a magazine for women called The Ladies Magazine. And uh, after mm-hmm. reading Northwood, he thought, uh, all right, I'm going to contact this woman and see if she wants to be the editor of this new magazine, making her um, the first ever female editor of a magazine in the United States. Uh, so obviously she took the job and this, this, she was reasonably successful at it. It was kind of a local, you know, New England thing at the time. Didn't really spread super far, but then it got to the attention of one Louis Antoine Godey, and he was the um, owner of the Godey's Ladies book among other, mm-hmm. among other journals. And he wanted Hale for his, after she'd been doing this, I think like a decade or so. And he, you know, he came across her and she wanted Hale to be the editor of his Godey, uh, Godey's Ladies book instead of himself editing mm-hmm. it. And so this, this he approached her and said, hey, do you want the job? And she said, no, I don't want the job because it would require me to move to Philadelphia. And she, her, hus- or, uh, her youngest son, William, was attending Harvard at the time in Boston, mm-hmm. and she wanted, uh, she wanted to be there while he you know, was in school. And so she didn't want to go to Philadelphia. So to get around the problem, Goaty simply purchased the ladies' magazine outright and then merged the two magazines and then just said, <laughs> hey, you can just keep the office up there and you can just run both magazines from Boston. That's a power move right yeah. there. <laughs> it's like, you won't, you won't work for me. I'll just buy the company you work for and now yeah. you definitely work it's amazing. for me. <laughs> like out of a comic book. Yeah. yeah. So this is what he did. And then she proceeded to run this for about four decades, uh, increasing the subscription from 25,000 subscribers when she took over to 150,000 subscribers. Now that doesn't sound like, you know, a lot. Well, yeah, but this was back in the day. How many people were in Yeah, America? this was 1% of the U.S. population subscribed to this magazine. Uh, and this, and when you consider like families, you know, families aren't going to have multiple people subscribing. It's even, you know, a higher percentage yeah. than that are actually getting this, or households, I should say. And so this, this was, you know, this was basically unparalleled in popularity at the time for, especially for a, a women's magazine. And it almost had no competition uh, in the in sort of the level they were, they were publishing at. So it was just hugely influential. But the thing is, is most journals at the time would just take they didn't there weren't enough American authors and original content being produced in America to to fill out mm-hmm. journals that were regularly published in magazines and things and so they would just take you know stuff from England and just kind of republish it and this was most this was <laughs> mostly what people published at the time yeah, kind of it kind of makes yeah. sense and and so they did this and uh, she on the other hand was like nope we're not going to do that number one we're pretty much only going to feature American authors and uh, and number two only original content. And so this resulted in because there just wasn't enough prominent American authors and stuff to write. She ended up writing about half of every article in the beginning yeah, in the journal herself. And this obviously made her greatly influential, like her opinions and her ideas on fashion and what women should cook. She did. She also published a few cookbooks on the side, um, what literature women should read, like all <laughs> with all of her extra time. Yeah. No. Yeah. She did many, many things. Uh, so, yeah, so just she was kind of like the, I don't know, Oprah of her day or whatever. In this yeah. in this thing, eventually there were enough authors and stuff that she didn't have to write so much, but she was still picking what was what was published. And her her um her actually because she would was really just focusing on American authors and stuff. Uh, this made like pretty much name a 19th century while well, she was uh, editor here American author and and they were published in her journal at some point. Like and and in some cases she helped popularize wow. them. Uh, by by doing this. And so like there was just like Oliver Wendell Holmes, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, Catherine Sedgwick, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and Washington Irvin, among many others. Uh, basically just name... Major influence. Yeah, Majorly influential. Name them. They, they at some point would publish something in her, her journal. Uh, and so, yeah, this... this uh, oh, she also did three three issues that were only... where she only 
did American female authors in the entire thing, which, which was also kind of, you know, uh, interesting and uh, rare. Yeah. And she also, you know, yeah. moving on from that in her journal and her editorials and, you know, outside, she also you know promoted education for women, which was kind of a big thing for her, um, played a big role in the foundation of Vassar college, which was the first college in the U S to grant degrees to women. Um, and also helped, uh, and she kind of fought hard for them when they were, um, Vassar was being established to get a female Im- administrator and female teachers, which was also quite rare at the time. Um, so yeah, and uh, Siemens Aid Society, have you heard of this at all? I have not. Oh, yeah, that's actually still a thing uh, that's around today, and that was established in 1833. Um, she helped found that one, and that's basically just to help women attain, you know, job skills, basically. And this was originally for people, women who lost their husbands at sea, and then they had, you know, children, typically. And had no way to support themselves. So this is kind of what it was for. And so, yeah, uh, Elizabeth Blackwell, first American doctor, or first American female doctor. She was um, tirelessly kind of pushed for her to be able to come, become a physician in the first place. There was a lot of Uh pushback from that. Uh, Bunker Hill Monument, which is a big monument. She, um, it was... Good Lord. Yeah. This just goes on. Yeah, it keeps going. It keeps going. And so this... The, the funding for it was kind of ran out and it was just not going to get completed. And so then she pushed her readers. She was like, hey, everyone donate a dollar to the cause. And it was that's about twenty five dollars a day. And so then she also organized a craft fair. And in the end, about thirty thousand dollars were raised, which raised, which is about three quarters of a million dollars a day. And that mm-hmm. allowed the monument to be finished um, and still oh, also Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon. She also was one who helped uh, push for that to be preserved and, you know, for through some of her efforts and her editorials on the subject helped that. How do you pre- how do you preserve a mountain? A Mount Vernon is actually the George Washington uh, estate. Oh, oh, like the place he lived or owned or? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's. Uh, have you ever seen um, National Treasure Two? Dude, what? I saw this movie. Like, oh no, it wasn't the second one. I I literally watched National Treasure like two nights ago because oh. I, I I I love kind of bad Nicolas Cage movies. Yeah, that's it. Um, that's like one of those that's bad, but it's also very entertaining, so it's kind of fun. Yeah. Oh, man, is it entertaining. Yeah. Yeah, the second... Classic Cage. The second one, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, there's a thing where they go to Mount Vernon to, uh, you know, kidnap the president or something like that. Okay. Yeah. I'm watching that super soon. Yeah. No, that, way before it's I watch Princess it's just, Bride. Oh, it's just as fun National as the National Treasure one. too. Yeah. <laughs> Princess Bride is fun, though, but also awesome, uh, you know. So, if that wasn't enough, while she was editing this journal and doing a lot of other things, she also published over 50 volumes of various novels, books of poetry, cookbooks, all sorts of things. And as a little aside, uh, so obviously, Mary had... I think I make a lot of YouTube videos. Yeah. This woman is like... Yeah, and raised five kids, by the way, um, at, by herself, oh, yeah, no, starting I... <laughs> at 34 years old. Um, Jeez. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, That's so impressive. Mary had Super a little lamb. Impressive. So Mary Had a Little Lamb, of course. Was, oh, yeah. And she wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. Yeah, that was in her second book of poems that she did. And this one, I just wanted to do a little quick aside here because Mary Had a Little Lamb got a little boost in popularity thanks to uh, there's, there's this children's magazine called Juvenile Miscellanea. So this was started by Lydia Maria, Lydia Maria Child. And so see why what kind of ties this into the, the Thanksgiving thing is that Lydia Maria Child is the author of the most famous of all Thanksgiving poems, which I think you're going to have heard of this, even though it's a Thanksgiving poem. So in 1844, she writes what is called the originally titled the New England Boys Song about Thanksgiving Day, which no one has probably heard of it by that name. Yeah, no, dude, I've definitely never heard of that. But you probably have heard of Over the River and Through the Woods. It's ringing bells. Yeah. yeah. Why? To grandfather's house we go, you know, that little thing, right? That, that... Uh, Honestly, honestly, when we were doing this, because I, I don't know, it's been a long time since I was a kid and I haven't had any kids yet. So <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of like, Mary had a little lamb. Yeah. I, I can't even remember that. Okay. I'm like, is it the da 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 da? Yeah. Or yeah. is that something no, else? That's, that, yeah, when it was, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but I couldn't, I couldn't even remember anything other than like, Mary had a little lamb, yeah. something, something, something. Yeah. I would, da, 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 da. I would be quite surprised if you not, would not recognize this one as well. Um, but this actually, most people today think it was a, it was a Christmas song, you know, but it was actually originally a Thanksgiving song about just going to this. She wrote it about um, this Lydia child. She wrote it about going to her grandfather's house on Thanksgiving, just sort of her memories of that and so this this just kind of ties it together it's just sort of the most famous thanksgiving you know poem or whatever song uh and yeah i i feel quite like normally when you mention things like this i'll I'll open like a little tab and see what's up and see if there's an interesting aside that i can throw in because i don't have any internet i did had no idea how much i relied on that and 
this sounds completely bizarre because obviously we're talking, but my internet just doesn't work on anything <laughs> except for our conversation. So I'm like, I can't even look up this poem right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it makes me feel exposed. Yeah. I don't have my Google sidekick. Yeah. Yeah, so this, uh, so finally, late 19th century, finally, she, I mean, she was born yeah. in 1788. So, uh, so 1877, she finally decides to retire, uh, almost 90 years old. And uh, yeah, so this the G- Godies was sold to Frank Mer- Munzee, Frank Munzee, that's a weird name. Uh, so yeah, so this was also actually the year she retired was also famously when Thomas Edison made his little uh, recording of Mary Had a Little Lamb on the phonograph this same year, yeah. same year that happened. And so this that is super cool. Yeah, she decides to retire. And in her farewell issue uh, as editor of the journal in December of 1877, she writes, And now, having reached my 90th year, I must bid farewell to my countrywomen with the hope that this work of half a century may be blessed to the furtherance of their happiness and usefulness in their divinely appointed sphere. New avenues for higher culture and for good works are opening before them, which 50 years ago were unknown. That they may improve these opportunities and be faithful to their higher vocation is my heartfelt prayer. She... uh, Something has changed. There's now commas. (laughs) <laughs> well, now it's the late 19th century, you see. Oh, oh there's it. Yeah, this is nice. These are like commas. Like I would use commas, and I'm not great at commas, but this they is, feel correct. Yeah, you go to the the late the late 18th century was uh, where you definitely see that where it's just like the page long things, and of course that's when she learned to read and write. And then uh, yeah, the late by the late 19th century there was that morphing, and so now it's a little bit more like like we would write it, um, more standardized like and. All that. So she finally, she died about a year and a half later on April 30th, 1879, at the age of 91 uh, years old. Quite a full life. That is, yeah, that is an 1879. How many people lived to 91 in 1879? Yeah, yeah. Four. I'm just kidding, but it wasn't many. (laughs) So now we're going to get to... It's like, also like my grandparents are around 90 now. And it's like... They're they're often availing themselves of like modern medicine and hospital trips yeah. and all of this stuff. Yeah, and I'm like, this was 1879. I'm like, surely something would have killed you by now without all this like intervention. Well, and not only that, but, but to work basically almost up to that point. Uh, I don't know if that's like a, a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. I think that probably keeps people alive. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway. All right, so now we're going to move on to some bonus facts, or rather, some myths about pilgrims so you 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 mentioned right at the beginning your what you knew about the pilgrims was basically they wore black and white clothing and buckled dude but, honestly my knowledge of the pilgrims is probably like i saw a picture of one of them when we made a video yeah. about this at some point i i really know nothing yeah. about this it's just not taught yeah, so, in, so in this England. yeah in the in the pictures that they're always black and white clothing buckled buckled top hats you know they got like the buckle on the hat and everything uh, yeah, and, I feel like I've maybe it was a painting I've seen in like a museum or something. Or, yeah, and so this this yeah. this was not a thing really around the Pilgrims' time. It was later in the late 17th century. It was like a popular clothing style, particularly among the wealthy. If you could actually afford buckles, you'd put like a buckle on your oh. you know your waist instead of just leather straps or whatever. And then if you're really rich, you could put a buckle on your hat, you know, your top hat and everything. Fancy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so this this was around when some of the the pilgrim stuff was sort of getting you know painted, famous paintings and stuff. So the the depictions kind of come from that sort of the late 17th century style, not actually yeah. what the not actually what the pilgrims would have worn. And then later when the, the whole story of the pilgrims became you know, kind of popular in the 18th and 19th century, the artists just sort of copied that idea. Uh, and so it wasn't really like what they actually wore was quite different. It was uh, so we actually even have a an account from we have like a lot of accounts from like wills and stuff like that. And uh, transcripts of what they what they brought, like little, you know, uh, receipts and things of what they brought over. And so we actually know exactly what they wore. And so for an, as just sort of an example, there was a guy named Brewster, who is a pilgrim, uh, and he yeah. uh, described in his will uh, his clothing, basically. And it was just... He describes like the most outrageously colorful outfit. <laughs> yeah. now, listen to this. One blue cloth suit, green drawers, a violet cloth coat, black silk stockings, sky blue garters, red grogain suit, red waistcoat, Tawny colored suit with silver buttons. This guy, yeah. he sounds like he's dressed like a clown. Yeah. And so they would, I mean, a thing was like your Sunday clothes would often be that sort of like black and white. That was kind of a thing just to sort of, you know, church, you don't oh, want to be sure, so like, like garish or whatever. Yeah, all the colors yeah. and 
everything. But otherwise, they they just wore really colorful things. That was the style at the time. We just wore you know random colors like this guy is talking A about violet coat. Yeah, uh, that was that was quite popular. And so yeah, they just had you know laces, leather laces instead of you know big belt buckles and things like that. And another myth. Yeah. So moving on, there's also the idea that the pilgrims would have died the first winter had the had the Native Americans not taught them you know agricultural tips and tricks. This is very common mm -hmm. uh, to be taught in schools and stuff today. And that's not true at all. They they were quite prepared when they came over. Funny enough, uh, they were they were well aware of a lot of the failures of previous you know colonies and stuff that had tried to establish in, in the region. So they actually had yeah. a seven year contract with various merchants to bring them supplies regularly, uh, just when they need them, food, clothing, etc. cetera, uh, to while they kind of built up and established their colony. So this was, I mean, sometimes like supply ships would sink and stuff like that. So that, you know, it was always like they, like when a supply ship would come in, like that was a great excuse for a day of thanks because the ship got there safely. Um, but they, you know, they were quite prepared with, with supplies and everything like that and had, were quite well versed in hunting and farming techniques and all that. And, you know, they, they, they kind of knew what they were doing. So that wasn't really, that wasn't really a thing, uh, as is commonly said. It does, yeah, it, it makes a nicer story that yeah. they went there and they helped out and they yeah. learned this agriculture. It's like, you don't just go off like half, it'd be like, Hey, we're going off to Mars and hopefully we'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure like, it out when we get there. Um, yeah, I think it's just because that one kind of ties into the idea that they invited the Native Americans, you know, to Thanksgiving as yeah, like a yeah, thanks, I, I, like, yeah. hey, thanks for, we got this feast because you guys, but it's not really um, yeah. how it worked out. Thanks for all this stuff. In exchange, it is a, we've got horrible diseases. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it makes a better story, oh, um, basically. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so this, you know, might also at this point be wondering why were they, why do we call them the pilgrims? Because they did not call themselves pilgrims. Right. And so this, this sort of the first time they'd ever sort of be, been called, this was actually William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation. Uh, so he kind of uses various biblical imagery to, to talk about their departure from Leiden in 1620. He says, so they left goody and pleasant city, which had been their resting place here twelve years, but they knew they were pilgrims and looked not much on these things, but lift up their eyes to ye heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. Yeah. This, everything in that sentence is spelled wrong, oh, yeah. obviously, yeah. because it's the past. My favorite misspelling <laughs> in that sentence is the spelling of country, yeah. which... If you just imagine another spelling of country where the fourth first four letters are a square word. Yeah. <laughs> I found this quite amusing. Yeah. I had a good laugh over my uh, <laughs> breakfast this morning reading this through. So, um, so yeah, and then they... <laughs> Their dearest country. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. So this... They... It's right there in the words. <laughs> this was the... This... Do we have to bleep that out? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get iTunes explicit. <laughs> Oh no! You said um, country. <laughs> so they, they they were not. No one else seems to, at least documented wise, have called them pilgrims after this thing until uh, Nathaniel Morton and Cotton Mather, or yeah, Cotton Mather in uh, 1669 and 1702, and they were just kind of paraphrasing Bradford's words at this point. Okay. And then it would be almost a century later before the next known reference of them being called pil pilgrims. It was in 1793 by Reverend Chandler Robbins who recited, again, he was reciting Bradford's words. Um, at, at, it was basically at a Plymouth Forefathers Day observance that was, you know, celebration being had. And this this mm -hmm. sort of, at this point is where it got, got caught on to toast the pilgrims of Leiden uh, as just on this sort of observance day. And then finally, it be, uh, kind of more wider uh, popularity, thanks to Daniel Webster. Um, he referred to the group as pilgrims um, at the Plymouth Bicentennial, which uh, ended up getting caught, caught on. And then from there, they were just called the pilgrims. Um, popularly, but they they didn't they didn't call themselves that. There you go. Yeah, pilgrims, not the pilgrims. Pilgrims not wearing black and white. Pilgrims not getting help from the Native Americans. Yeah. All of the things you know about the pilgrims, they were lies. <laughs> yeah, but pretty pretty much. And then, uh, so speaking of of origin of names, I wanted to. We talked about Black Friday a little bit. So. Uh, the origin of the name Black Friday. It's common. This again, it just kind of comes around. I think I know this. Isn't this because of the ledgers? Uh, this is, yeah, that's one of the common myths. That's what everyone says, oh. really. 
but that one that one is a myth. So that that one actually got around in the 1980s was when it first popped up, which was um, a couple decades after the first known instance of it actually being called Black Friday. So it's you know definitely not that one. Uh, but so it was just that idea for people who don't know is this that retailers operated a financial loss until Black Friday and then everything you know they make money at. But that's just not. If you look at really like any SEC filings of retailers, that's just not true at all. Like you can't really operate a business unless unless you're like making Christmas supplies or something. I suppose. Uh, in a loss the rest of the year that's just not going to work out for yeah. you um, so that's just not really a thing did we make a video about this and then i think i must have remembered the myth rather than the truth <laughs> almost five it could happen almost five years ago yes we mentioned this in a video so you know okay or maybe five years three ago. or four we, years three years maybe four years ago and i think we were making videos five years ago. well it was so. it was before we actually started the channel as the channel in which we did it was long before like there was like a year gap when we did some test stuff remember that oh my god yeah i do remember that yeah oh wow well, this was when we were making the the was this like the superman in his underwear yeah one that one had was, like cartoonish style that animators was super popular that was i mean we posted that and then i don't know it got like a half million views like almost right away we should have just kept yeah. going at that point <laughs> yeah we should have been like oh maybe we're onto something <laughs> <laughs> instead we waited a year good time too yeah yeah, at that point, uh, Gizmodo was republishing like everything we did on Today I Found Out, which is, is just hilarious because all the time I still, to this day, you're just ripping off Gizmodo. It's like, well, if you actually look at the author... It says there at the a... bottom of the Gizmodo article. <laughs> yeah. It's not like they even ripped it off. It's like, thanks to Today I Found Out. No, and the Gizmodo was great because they would even, like the related links I, I specifically would put in uh, just because Gizmodo would just copy and paste. Like they wouldn't even remove the related <laughs> links. So it was always just like, hey, here's all these other Today I Found Out stuff. Um, but yeah, they were republishing our videos and stuff too at that time. So yeah, that would that would have been good. We should have kept going. Live and learn. Anyway, we're doing okay. Yeah. We're, anyways, so the uh, the other one, the other cop, uh, popular one that you'll hear people say is that Black Friday was named after the Great uh, Depression stock market crash in 1929. But this actually occurred on a Tuesday, not a Friday. And uh, there was a Black Friday, something called Black Friday stock market scare that happened in 1869. But that was in September and uh, had to do with gold prices. Had nothing to do with Thanksgiving. And is not where the name came from. So where did it actually come from? It turns out police officers in New England uh, sort of had this nickname for the day after Thanksgiving, because this was right. not a this was not a good day to work. Basically, as a police officer, or you know, because their people were getting in accidents, trafficy all the time. And so we have the earliest documented. Uh, Why? What? Like a drunk or no? Just traffic. <laughs> uh, just traffic from people shopping, basically, which was ah. So people would always go shopping. Yeah. Like really, Thanksgiving's over. By Let's the end of shopping. November, let's begin the Christmas shopping. Yeah, this and this uh, before the internet, internet. We don't have that before it's the like, before the internet was. You know, everyone shopped online instead. Like if you go back, mm, I mean, the internet was around, of course, but if you even go back like a decade, the traffic was just a nightmare. And it's, I mean, it still is in some places on Black Friday, but like nowadays, even in those places like in Seattle and stuff where I grew up, like the traffic's not so bad on Black Friday anymore. But like it used to just be like gridlock everywhere. Um, now everyone just shops online. Uh, but this this was a this was a thing all the way back in uh, December of 1961 when we have the first uh, known reference of the, the the day after Thanksgiving being called Black Friday. So we have Denny Griswold of the Public Relations News stating, "In Philadelphia, it became customary for officers to refer to the post Thanksgiving days as Black Friday and Black Saturday. Hardly a stimulus for good business. The problem was discussed by merchants with their deputy city representative. He recommended adoption of a positive approach, which would convert Black Friday and Black Saturday into Big Friday and Big Saturday. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah." <laughs> I, it's not super creative. <laughs> no, and that obviously didn't catch on, but the Black Friday that did. did. Not stick around. What a yeah. shocker. <laughs> yeah, and so Black Friday did, and you can see from this point on, just there's lots of references in various newspapers uh, of just it being called Black Friday. Sort of caught on from there. And, uh, cool. Yeah. But it sounds much better. Black Friday sounds like, I yeah. don't know, because now we just have associations with it being for sales, yeah. but I'm like, yeah, Black Friday. Yeah. It sounds saley. Yeah. It's just an association. So what, what, uh, so, uh, British holidays around this time, what do you got? Um, dude, I, I don't really, again, I'm, I am deprived of my internet, so I can't look it up, <laughs> but I, I really don't think there's anything. I don't think there's anything particular nothing, until Christmas nothing. now. I know you have like after Christmas, you have like boxing day, right? Yeah. Like say so the 25th, 26th, the holidays, then it's back to work until New Year's. Yeah. So what do you do on boxing day? Uh, I, 
again, I'm always basing this because it's always based on my what my family did. Yeah. Uh, we would usually go to my grandma's house or my aunt's and uncle's house and like celebrate, you know, exchange Christmas gifts with them. And then I think there's some specific meal you have, but I'm not sure. My grandma would always make crazy Christmas crackers. Do you have Christmas crackers in the US? Uh, not really, but I do know what they are. Oh, dude, these are cool. I'll bring you some yeah. um, next time we see each other. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I actually, this is a missed opportunity. These are fun. They're, I, they're cool. You get like a Christmas hat. You get a joke. Yeah. You get no, like I, some. I, t- I saw, uh, what was it? Maybe two or three years ago, there was a the BBC or something had this YouTube thing that they did. And I don't think they do it anymore, but they they were basically describing these different British traditions. And that was the first time I'd ever even heard of a, of the Christmas cracker thing. Dude, you're getting some Christmas crackers. Yeah. I, I took them to my to my wife's family, uh, who's Czech, last, last year, two years ago, maybe. Everyone loves crackers. Crackers are yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, cool. For those who don't know, they, 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 you pull this piece of, it's like a little box with handles and you pull it and it snaps and it makes a sound and then there's stuff inside. It's, it's fun. Um, was there a, did you ask me a question? Yeah, I just was wondering if there was any other like holidays around that, like around the, from like Black Friday-ish to Christmas that I don't know about because I, I wouldn't be surprised. Don't think so. We just had Armistice Day, which is like the 11th of November, but that's not a day off. You just have a minute so, of silence at 11 o'clock. That's it. So you don't um, you don't have really Halloween too much either. So like, what is it like the holiday? Like, because in the US you have. Yeah, dude, when, when we were recording podcasts and you were like, yeah, I'm taking Halloween off. I'm like, what? <laughs> like Halloween is, is, is something more than just an afterthought of, ah, I'm probably going to get drunk at a friend's party on the Hall- weekend. <laughs> no, Halloween is the best as a kid because it's just like free candy. Like, and, and that's true. It's like the one time of year where your parents, I mean, not all parents, but usually will let you just like gorge on the candy as well. It's just like, have all the candy you want type of thing. I mean, uh, and so it's just fun. You get to dress up, go do stuff. And then, and for adults, of course, the, the parties are fun too, but, uh, you know, kids is way better. We have a little bit of that, but I think we just appropriated it from you. Yeah. So it's a bit, um, it's just sort of the, it's just, cause like, it's just like a nice time of year where you got like the fall and you got the holiday season really stretches out into like three months, basically between these, these three things and then New Year's. It's just like a great time. Whereas you just have Christmas kind of and New Year's, I suppose. It's, it's just, yeah, dude, most people are just miserable because it's like, <laughs> it's like, oh, winter's coming. No. And then it's like, there's just several months of misery. See? Then you have uh, like... I think people tolerate November because they know Christmas is coming, but we don't really do any like pre-Christmas celebrating. Yeah. It's just there's like lights in stores and stuff. See, that's just and it's then like the, it's so fun that little stretch of time, especially as a kid and stuff, is when you get lots of holidays from school and stuff as well. Yes, you have school holidays for like yeah. I think we had four weeks of holidays and. Oh yeah, no, to- totally. Like Europe in general has so many more holidays than the U.S. As far I mean, like days off type things oh, than yeah, the u.s is sure. so it's like the one time of year where u.s gets to do stuff like that i think that's true i think like because it's pretty standard to have like i don't know i've not i've not really had a job but i remember when <laughs> i was like looking at careers and stuff as a student it would be like you'd have somewhere between like 21 and 28 days off a year uh, yeah and then once you've combined those in with weekends it's basically like i think four or five or six weeks off a year yeah. At like an entry level. And then you can get like more as you go forward. Yeah. So we're less crazy about the national holidays, I think, because we're like, yeah. I don't know. You just I, think, get, I feel people get like enough holiday. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm just, I don't take that much holiday. Yeah. No. But yeah, that's not really that. Those uh, That amount of days in the US is like if you've worked someplace a really long time and it's a really good, nice company, and then that might actually let you take that time off, like even if you have it and not give you a hard time, you know, and just that, like that sort of like culture of like, oh, you're taking the day off, you know, like sort of thing yeah you guys just i don't know and i'm i'm probably wired a bit more american in my way of thinking about work but you guys are typically more motivated about work than us and about success and and this kind of thing i is my impression i don't know if i, I don't know if it, for most people motivated would be the right word more like you'll come in or you know we'll replace you <laughs> yeah whether you're motivated by the <laughs> carrot or the stick either way you're going to work <laughs> yeah no um or or like no, or no. like when you work for yourself and you just don't holidays. What it's a holiday? Well, I still it's... have to work. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, even when I'm on holiday, I'm like, I I could crack open my laptop for a few hours. My emails are building up. I got some ideas to jot down. No, I will say, as a, as a way with kids, like the, the kid holidays, I do like I, like you said. I'm like, nope, I'm taking that day off. It's the, yeah, you know, yeah. You know. October the thirty first, taking a holiday. Yeah. You know. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, that was a very long way of me saying that no, we do not have any Thanksgiving equivalent holiday yeah. that I'm aware of. I don't have any internet connection. So British people, <laughs> if you want to have a go at me being like, Simon, you totally forgot about the three days that we take off at the end of November. Yeah. Well, oh, the, the, uh, is it actually celebrated the, the the 5th of November? Like, is that actually like an actual thing? It's not a holiday. It's just, will we uh, set off fireworks and then burn people on? <laughs> I mean, hang on, let me phrase that correctly. <laughs> we make effigies of Guy Fawkes and then we build a giant bonfire and we burn him on the bonfire. It's, <laughs> it's kind of bizarre when you think about it. It is, but it's super fun. Uh, but that just <laughs> like, it would be like you in a couple of hundred years, building an effigy of Bin Laden, <laughs> just burning him on a bonfire. <laughs> and, and this guy didn't even succeed in his terrorism. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Uh, but again, I think it's just humans, any excuse to party, to throw a party, basically. It doesn't take much. Speaking of hijacking planes. Yeah. Did you like that? Yeah, we did have follow up because in, I don't know, because we our episodes were out of order. But at some point in the last few episodes, we uh, mentioned the uh, some guy who was going to kill either Nixon or um, Reagan. And so I, I thought we should actually clarify what that story was uh -huh. all about, because it's kind of interesting. Through This was the guy who you said he like he hijacked a plane, but he did it on the tarmac. Yeah. And so this okay. this is basically what he was trying to do was to crash the plane for people who didn't listen to that one. He was going to hijack a plane, uh, a commercial airliner, and then crash it into the White House and kill, it turns out, Nixon was the one he was going for and this happened a fairly bold plan yeah this happened on february 22nd 1974 the man's name was samuel joseph bick or bike i'm gonna say bick what do you think mm -hmm. i'd yeah. say bick b-y-c-k as you might imagine he was not uh, the most sane individual in the world uh mm -hmm. and he had actually wound up on the fbi and the secret services uh, list basically the, the people to keep an eye on because of some of his <laughs> things he would say and stuff. But this didn't stop him from managing to steal a gun from someone. Okay. Uh, so he's uh, Smith & Wesson. I, I would make a joke about America and guns. Yeah. But... No, he, he couldn't. He actually, because he was on this list, even at that point in the 1970s, he could not buy a gun. Uh, so, But he managed to steal one, a uh, 22 caliber six-shot gun from a friend. Uh, it was, uh, and just, you know. He, it's not a powerful weapon. No, it's not. And, uh, but, you know, it'll still do damage if you hit the right places. And so sure. this, he brought 40 rounds of ammunition. And the other thing he did was to make a bomb. Uh, but he made it out of like, gasoline in a, in just a little um, container. And it, it, it didn't even have just, like a fuse. It, he had like two. Wait, just gas, like liquid yeah, that you put in a car? Yeah, in two Valvoline oil containers was what he did. And um, placed them in a suitcase. This was, they didn't have fuses or anything. It's not like the most. That's not a bomb. That's a fire. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he could have started a fire. Although I don't <laughs> think, it, uh, I don't know. I mean, he must have brought some way to light it. Uh, this wasn't listed in the FBI notes. Uh, so either way, okay. either way, <laughs> not super effective, but the gun was something. And he did manage to get through airport security at first. But then at one point he did encounter a security officer who was, uh, you know, basically uh, stopped him. And uh, so he pulls out the gun. He shoots the officer who unfortunately um, is killed. And then he sprints oh, for... This got serious suddenly. Yeah, no, it gets... I mean, it's serious. He's trying to crash a plane into the White House, but he sounds like a bit of a... Yeah, it, it was a uh, little bit comical at first, but no, he is incompetent, but also also was deadly, inco deadly incompetent. Uh, so he Jeez. he did, he killed the security officer. Then he runs. And at this point, like, he was fine. He No one stopped him. He's just running. Uh, there was another security officer who heard the shots and so then came running, but the the... The big guy had already gone, you know, towards the plane. And so he picks this plane. Uh, this, so this all is occurring at the Baltimore, Washington International Airport. And so yeah. uh, the, I should mention, the police officer who was shot was named. Is that, is, that, is that Washington, your Washington, or Washington politics, Washington? Uh, Washington, D.C. Okay, politics, Washington. Yeah, uh, so the... <laughs> Yeah, so he obviously you have politics in Washington State. I just mean like yeah. no, it is confusing for me. It's like it's so what, what House of Cards is set. Yeah, yeah, District of Columbia, the West Wing. Uh, so the so he shoots the police officer George Ramsberg, um, kills him. Then he manages to get aboard a McDonnell Douglas DC nine that's about to take off. So the passengers are all loaded. These hold around seventy to hundred people, depending on the configuration. And so it was loaded cool. uh, with passengers. And so he runs into the cockpit, and uh, he then demands that they take off basically and then as he's demanding this he then shoots in the head the co-pilot fred jones um kills him obviously and dude yeah no he's and this this of course the the pilot reese reese lofton was like okay uh, and so he starts <laughs> the engine 
uh, and he's going to go yeah. take off um, at this point. But then, then, so Bic very briefly leaves the cockpit and then he runs right back and then shoots the co-pilot again. And again, the co-pilot's already dead. The already dead co-pilot? Yeah, with his head, you know, shot. He's already dead, so he shoots him again. And at this point, oh, and he also shot Lofton kind of in the back, but didn't kill him at this point. Um, and so, wait, Lofton was the captain. Yeah, the, the actual the pilot who is still yeah. alive. And so at this point, Lofton was like, "All right, this is just a crazy person, so I'm going to try to trick him." And so he says, he tells Bick, he says, "Hey, you need to go shut the doors, or I can't take off." Um, and so Bick actually leaves. And at this point, shut the, shut the doors to the air. Yeah, to the aircraft. Shot. You need to get them shut. So Bick leaves to go shut the doors. And at this point, of course, Lofton gets on to the ATC and is like uh, air traffic control. And he's and he's guys, uh, yeah, he's uh, we got a crazy person here with a gun, and he's killed my co-pilot, and he shot me. Uh, so this, and of course, at this point, the the police officer who had heard the shots did. He was out there now uh, at the DC nine, and uh, he couldn't. He saw. Uh, Bick and a couple stewardesses trying to shut the door, and so he starts. He opens fire there. They but they get the door shut first. And this, I think, this this police officer, again, Bick and a couple stewardesses standing next to each other opens fire on Bick from range, uh, and, and just you know what a, the stewardess. What? <laughs> there's passengers. <laughs> this is like completely loaded plane. You just. It sounds like a movie. It does. Collateral damage. It, what collateral damage? Yeah, I mean, it was like the 1970s, I guess, but the, I don't, I'm just not seeing the, you know, like maybe a sharpshooter would do that. But it's like the 1970s, so they had less accurate weaponry. <laughs> it's like in um, It's a Wonderful Life. There's that scene towards the end where the where the um, he goes and he punches the one guy and then or he punches the police officer and then he runs off and then the police officer like tell you tell you what man what do you think the odds of me zero <laughs> percent. That is a great movie. That is my third, my third to the my most favorite movie of all time. But anyway, so at the end, he's he goes and he just like opens fire in a crowded. So he's running along in amidst a crowd and the police officer just opens fire on him. Um, so, yeah, that this is sort of like that happening here. And so this he doesn't hit Bick. The doors get shut. So Bick goes back uh, to the pilot and then um, shoots the dead co-pilot again at this point. For the third time? Yeah. And uh, what is wrong with this guy? Yeah. And at this point, he also shoots the pilot a couple more times. But again, the pilot actually survives all this. Um, he's like he's playing a video game. You know, when you're playing like one of those games yeah. and you can't work out what the next stage of the game is yeah. and you get really frustrated. And so you end up shooting the bad guy and you're like, Argh! this was definitely the like, I'll just show up and do whatever and see if it works out. And he, he got, I mean, he got really close to being successful. Uh, Dude, he got through security with a gun. Yeah. And the engines are on. And it, and the police actually that that were gathered out, they then tried to shoot out the tires, but their guns weren't powerful enough, and just the bullets didn't actually penetrate the tires, which is kind of wow. interesting. Uh, I just thought because you know there's that Serious Hollywood tires. trope where they're always shooting at the driver or whatever, and it's like guys, just shoot the tires, you know, like, then yeah. the car can't go anywhere. But anyways, the, they never do that. But this time, apparently, they did. According to the reports, tried to shoot the tires and it didn't work out. Um, but so the one police officer again, he uh, at this point he sees through the little window. Uh, the, he sees Bick, and so he opens fire on him again. The pilot's in there, you know. He doesn't know they're dead, right? At this point, yeah. and so but he opens fire anyway. And this time he does. These guys up. <laughs> yeah, he does kill Bick. He shoots him, and uh, so later when they come in, they they find Bick. He's dead, lying on the floor. Um, and then actually three days later, they actually got why. You know, at this point, nobody knew why Bick did this. Like, what was he trying to accomplish here? And so uh, uh, three days later, the Miami news desk did. They get a letter from that he had mailed previously about why he was trying this this thing. Uh, it, it, the letter read, It has become evident to me that this government that I love dearly will not respond to the needs of the majority of the American citizens. The majority of the people in government, the so-called public servants, are financed by special interest groups, and if they are servants, they are servants to these groups. Now is the time. Independent-minded citizens must take back the government before their government takes complete control of them all. I, for one, will not live in a controlled society, and I would rather die as a free man than live like a sheep. Power to the people! I had to read it like that. It's just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's inappropriate capitalization there, Sam. Uh, power to the people signed Sam Bick. Yeah. Um, but speaking, he also sent uh, one letter to one Jack Anderson, which is a very famous reporter that, I don't know, maybe a lot of people haven't heard of him today, but he was basically notorious for his ability to dig out uh, government corruption and FBI, like, stuff that the FBI knew. 
and just a lot of corruption and stuff. And, and this Nixon hated him because of this. And so Nixon actually <laughs> stupid anti corruption. <laughs> I know Nixon. Uh, so he at one point classic Nixon. They're in a meeting uh, with various aides, and and Nixon says, let's see where. Oh, he says he wanted his people to figure out how to get rid of Anderson, and he didn't specify what this meant. But apparently they interpreted it as they needed to kill Anderson. And so G. Gordon Liddy and oh. E. Howard Hunt, uh, uh, two members of the Nixon administration, they say, OK, uh, we're going to we're going to, you know, they, they is this like confirmed? Like or they, is this... this is what they say happened. Uh, they said they were ordered by a senior <laughs> White House aide to kill Anderson. And this was the story because Nixon was like, we need to get rid of him. Um so, oh my God, that's ultra intense. It is. I mean, of course, Nixon denied that he had any involvement or what meant he wasn't meaning to kill him. Um, they just needed to. It's fairly ambiguous. You yeah. don't want to say, like, uh, get rid of this guy. Yeah. And so, so these two, they went to the CIA and asked to kind of the best way to kill him and make it look like an accident, <laughs> basically, or just sort of a random things. But luckily for Anderson, he did not die because uh, a couple of weeks later or a few weeks later, the Watergate scandal hit and these two were implicated in that. And so this mm. was, um, you know, wow, yeah. that's, uh, that, that's, uh, yeah. So there was actually, I mean, Sam Bick was on, there was some corruption there. I mean, Nixon, obviously a lot of corruption, but you know, yeah, I, I get it, but it looks there's due process yeah. and Maybe. probably you don't want to shoot the yeah, like random three times. Shooting, it makes you look crazy. Shooting random people who, you know, had nothing to do with anything. Um, yeah, yeah maybe not the best way to go about it, but probably uh, not. In any event, so another follow-up, a much shorter follow-up. So in the Slinky episode, I couldn't remember what the Slinky meant. Remember that in the dictionary, like what, how they came up with that? The wife came up with it. She found it in the dictionary. And it turns out... Oh, wait, because we were talking about the Slinky, the toy, and it, yeah. how it was popularized. Yeah, and so how she came up with the name. And it turns out, I, I sort of remembered correctly, it meant sinuous, curvy, and slender. And so you basically describe a woman or, or their clothing as, you know, Slinky, if they were kind of a yeah. curvy, slender woman. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Now I I, I can sleep at night. <laughs> yeah. I was I was up a week yeah. sweating about the yeah. meaning of Slinky. Yeah. So is that all the follow up? That is all the follow up I had for this one. Um, we did. We should get to some reviews, maybe. Yeah, I love it. I, I, that plain story is kind of is terrible, but fascinating. Like yeah. I'm glad we followed up on that. Yeah, that was nice. It was. I mean, like a classic example of doing exactly what of someone trying to do exactly what uh, would later happen in uh, 2001. All right. Well, reviews. Uh, are we starting with the five star one? Yes. From uh, Leave Me Alone. And I suppose we're not leaving them alone by uh, bringing up their review on this podcast. But here we go. I follow your YouTube channel. I enjoy listening to your very informative and educational videos. I was listening to your podcast videos on your YouTube channel. But after hearing Simon stating doing so is hurting the actual podcast, I decided to make the switch. Thank you very much for the top notch content. And thank you for switching over. It does make a difference. It makes a big If everyone from the YouTube listeners would come and listen on the podcast, this would be huge for the show. FYI, everyone. Yeah. It does help us. It basically, if people come, the, the, the reasoning behind this is if we had the numbers that we see on YouTube come over to the actual podcast, it would basically rank us better in that iTunes much, store and then we'd better. see even more people come. Yeah. And that is obviously what we want because we like it when people listen to us. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're narcissistic that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> Then we have another one. So thank you, Leave Me Alone. We appreciate it. And for the kind review. Uh, I, I knew I saw this review. And I'm like, Damon's bringing this up. Do you want me to read it? And then you can go through your chit-chat. Yeah, this was, uh, chat. this was the first. So most of the, I mean, I think like 99% of our reviews are all five stars. And there's a few, you know, not five stars. But this one was the first one. And generally, I agree no, with the criticism. This, is, this was the first on one. And we bring it up and we're like, this is fair. Yeah, this is the first one I thought like, no. You're wrong, Mr. Ona Bender. Who says, Of a show named Brain Food, one would not anticipate so much glancing over and omission of factual detail. Now, uh, now would one expect so much spec... Uh, I assume he means one wouldn't expect yeah, so much um, speculation, yeah. and I don't know, cheap takeout at best, hard burn to follow. So, take it away, man. I know you are. <laughs> I, I, I knew this was coming. So, <laughs> cheap takeout of information. Now, no... It, what, what it comes down to is that most most shows and most education, they'll just say something is fact. Like if it's sort of like the most commonly thought story or whatever, like the one that most people believe. But if you don't have 
like the hard documented evidence to back it up. If it is just a story that, that people say, like if you don't have the, the thing, like we're not going to we're going to say we're going to be like this is just speculated because we don't know for sure, really. But most most shows don't do this. So it seems more definitive and, it, you know, it's better that way. But in our case, no, I'm, we're going to say. I don't know, this is just speculated because there doesn't actually seem to be any sort of like uh, primary documents or whatever supporting the story. But, you know, it might might seem very plausible or whatever. So so that and, and of course, the other part of, of saying I don't know, like we're not going to say we know something if we don't know. Yeah, you're right. I completely agree with you 100 percent. Yeah. And so um, that, that is kind of the point, I think. Sorry, go on. Yeah, that's kind of the point of like the original Today I Found Out was to make something ultra, ultra accurate and not just, you know, speculate. And so we are pedantic to the extreme on everything. And so that's just kind of what we're going for. And it's not a lack of depth of research. It is actually quite a detailed depth of research that then shows that now nah, this is just something people say or sometimes. And I think the, like an overarching thing for me is it should really be okay to say you don't know. Oh, absolutely. Like, we kind of have this thing in modern society, I feel, in general, where it's like, yes or no, one or the other. You either, you know, this is true or this is untrue. There's, but it's always gray. Yeah. And I think people should generally be pretty okay with just saying, I don't know, I need to look into it more, rather than get choose something and based on minimal information. And then the insane thing is, once someone has done that, it's just so well known how impossibly hard it is to shift someone's opi opinion once they've already stated it. Exactly. And it's just, so. it, it's like, just unfortunately, when you're researching stuff of stories that happened, you know, 1700s or 1800s, I mean, it just wasn't, you know, it's not like every detail is getting documented. So they're just, those details don't often exist. Um, and so, I mean, like, yeah. there's sometimes like trial notes and stuff, and you can get really detailed and stuff like that, or things like that, or our first town accounts and stuff. But lacking those, there's just a lot of speculation in the end and there's a, no amount of research wherever, you know, you can just research and then you say what's the most popular thought or whatever. But you still have to say this was speculation or something. So, yeah. Yeah. Not to gonna that one. That one. I was like, no, that's not we're not yeah, going to change I, that about the show. Like the other the other sort of, uh, you know, non five stars are like, yeah. All right. You know, that's fair. Maybe we should look at that or change that. But like, no, no, this one's not changing. I, I, I have to say, like, when I first thought about this, I was like, because I, I, I really don't like it when you when someone says like, hey, I'd like some information or some criticism about it. Someone gives them criticism and then tells them how they're wrong because yeah. they think yeah. that's just like you are flawed in your methodology. Whereas this, I feel we've we've every and we bring up our negative reviews yep. and we say like, OK, this is absolutely right. We're not going to change it because of this or we are going to change it. And this is why this show is very different to how the show was on day one, mm. because we listen to criticism. And then I was like, no, it's cool. You can bring this up. And I because it is defensible. And I think we are right. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> are you ready to make yourself feel better with a final five star review before we sign off on this exceptionally long episode? Yes. Riley588 says... I have tried and failed in the past to find a good podcast exactly like this, something with dashing narrators, discussing random facts and telling interesting stories. I now, I'm now, i now a hit at all the parties. Okay, I don't go to that many parties. But I did shock and awe some people with the factoid about children getting sent in the mail. I like that random aside. <laughs> okay, I don't go to that many parties. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, this is this is like the much. this is the other the other point of starting today. I found out was when you're on that you know you're at a party you're in the you just arrive you got the circles all around and you want to enter a circle you need like something to say you need to be like hey guys you know I do that at all my parties yeah. <laughs> when I just I just show up no one knows who I am and I just <laughs> I just I just stroll over to random people and go you know what in whatever it was people used to send children through the mail. And people are like, uh, we were talking about Jeff's uh, job and be like, oh, yeah, my bad. I'll just leave. <laughs> um, but no, it is. It is good fun. We do have a review contest going on, right? Yep. Uh, yes. And I think we by the time this goes out, everything is so out of order. I've become incredibly confused because we had various advertisers yeah. need to go on specific dates. So we apologize for things being out of order the last few weeks. Yeah, we had, uh, they had the tech history was actually the first one we recorded of the last three, but then we just published it. And so it's completely out of order. So people will now have found out if they won yes. that first review competition. So at some point I need to check the email address for this podcast, which I haven't done in a shamefully long time. <laughs> 
and see who's followed up with us. I don't remember the names of the people. We'll follow up with you again if you haven't emailed us. Yeah. Tech history. Tech history part three at the end that people can go and listen to the winners. Good. Okay. Thank you. You're very well organized. And right now we are having another contest. We have 233 reviews on iTunes America right now. Uh, When that hits over 300, we're going to go through all of the iTunes stores and the big podcast things and choose someone at random to win an Amazon gift voucher of $300 because we've got 300 reviews. That's how we do things. We did it at 200 at 200. So yeah, that's what we're up to. You know what's funny about that? That's the other thing about the the two-star review there. Is I think that is the oh, no. you, you, you can leave it alone. <laughs> I at think some that point. is the first time. Usually, it's just it, this one. I actually kind of thought it was funny too because we, we always get accused of going into too much detail and going too deep. Yeah. Like that is the thing people complain about, and I think this is the first time we've ever had someone complain about supposedly not going too deep. You're right. I think I was sold. You've now <laughs> sold the audience. We can let this alone. No, we're not letting uh, it go. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's seriously in a year it'll be like hey man you remember that review (laughs) i'm still angry (laughs) let's let's wrap it up there thank you everybody for listening go leave us a review uh drop us an email uh podcast at todayfoundout.com if you've got something to say head over to our forums at forums.todayfoundout.com check out our youtube channel today i found out you can find that plugging it into youtube check out some of my other stuff i do a top tens channel i do a politics channel i do a biography channel I don't want to just go to my ooh, website. Ooh, history, Actually, uh, um, highlight history. Highlight history. Dude, we haven't even launched this yet. And we've got like yeah. 8,000 subscribers. Yeah, it's great. I think we do. It's yeah. cool. If you search that, does it come up yet? I don't think so. I'll try it. Okay. So, it's quite tricky to recommend it on a podcast when you try searching highlight, highlight history. History does not come up. But it does. If, if you just go to the Today I Found Out YouTube channel on the sidebar of the thing, it does show up there. And uh, no content, about 8,000 subscribers so far for some reason. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see. But it, it, it's a new channel we're launching. It's launching it soon, way, just, very soon, yeah. ish. <laughs> it's always the way. Go check that out. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for all this stuff. In exchange, we've got horrible diseases.